can't think of a better book to talk about, and I can't think of a better place to talk about it. Taking Liberties, The War on Terror and the Erosion of American Democracy. Uh, Susan Herman, coming all the way from New York. Please, welcome to the Sanctuary for Independent Media. It's great to have you here. Well, thank you, Steve. I am very pleased to be here tonight. Um, I first actually heard about the Sanctuary for Independent Media when you became a client of the Civil Liberties Union in the case that Steve was just describing. And I was just given the opportunity to find out more about that with this indie video production called Art Doesn't Equal Terrorism. And as Steve was describing the case, I was thinking about, you know how whatever you're doing, you see the entire world through the filter of what you're doing? Well, it sounded to me like Steve was really describing my book. And here's what um, the summary on the back of the, uh, the case here says. Um, when the exhibition was given refuge by the Sanctuary for Independent Media, the city government responded by shutting down the space. This story shows racist fear-mongering in the guise of counter-terrorism and what ordinary folks can do to fight back. Well. That's why I wrote this book. It's all about not just racist fear-mongering, but all sorts of fear-mongering and all sorts of ways in which the rights and lives of ordinary Americans and our very democracy itself have been compromised by, um, in, in the guise of counterterrorism. And it's also about what ordinary folks can do back. So my book is about not only um, the harm that's been done to ordinary Americans, but also the ways in which ordinary Americans have risen to the occasion already and can continue to do so. So since we're talking about racist fear-mongering and telling stories, which is you know, so much of what this project is all about, you, know, you tell people the stories, you don't just deal in abstractions, I thought maybe I would begin by giving you a few examples of racist fear-mongering, some of the stories I tell in my book. And you can't really see from there, because I don't have a PowerPoint or anything, the fact that I have pictures. But you'll be able to see those in the middle of the book. So these are all very photogenic people you know, that I'm going to tell you about. Um, the first example of racist fear-mongering in the guise of counterterrorism. There is a young man in the city of New York who became a client of the New York Civil Liberties Union. His name is Jangir Sultan. And he lives in Brooklyn, like me. He is of Kashmiri descent. He's an American citizen. And you know the program that the New York Police Department started of doing cert random searches in the subways? Okay, if anybody can visualize the New York City subways, there are a lot of entrances, a lot of people in the subways. And what they do is they choose by some system, you know, however they do it randomly, they choose certain subway stops where they go and they set up a table. And anybody who comes into the subway at that entrance, they'll stop if they have a bit large bag or backpack. They'll, they'll, they don't actually stop everybody. They only stop the people whose cell phones are ringing. Uh, <laughs> or you know, they stop people randomly, you know, whatever number of people. So um, Jangir Sultan got really a little bit annoyed the 21st time that he was stopped. Uh, in a period of a couple of years, you know, not really that long. They just kept stopping him. And he was looking you know, at the people who looked like you know, many of you other people in the audience. They weren't stopping, but they kept stopping him. So he was humiliated and angry and furious and frustrated. And you know, just he kept being stopped. So he went to the Civil Liberties Union, which took on his case. And um, somebody had the very interesting idea of hiring a statistician to calculate the odds of his being stopped that often if the stops were, in fact, random. Uh, the statistician came up with the figure 1 in 165 million. So uh, the, and the New York lawyers concluded that they didn't really have too much of a defense against the idea that there had been some racial profiling going on in the New York City subways. Um, they offered to settle with Mr. Sultan. They offered him some money. And he said, you know, I'm not really in this for the money. What I would really like is for you to change your policy so that this won't happen again to me or to other people. They said, we'll give you the money. So they settled the lawsuit, and he is still calling the New York Civil Liberties Union because he keeps being stopped. It just keeps happening to him, you know, these random stops. OK, so on the one hand, um, clear instance of racial profiling and what we're covering by having all these you know, security measures, post 9-11 security measures. On the other hand, is this a really good way to prevent terrorism? Well, the New York Civil Liberties Union actually brought a lawsuit in federal court to say, this isn't really much of a way to stop terrorism. So think about the New York City subway system. Millions of people ride the subway every day. There are, I don't even begin to know how many thousands of different subway stops with how many different entrances. And then there's the 
small number of officers who the NYPD assigns to this project. What are the odds, we would need another statistician to calculate the astronomically small odds that the NYPD is gonna to happen to be at the exact subway stop where the terrorist is walking down the steps with the bomb in his backpack at that exact time and that the terrorist is the person who they're gonna to happen to choose to look at his backpack. It's just you know, not at all likely to happen. So what if it did happen? What if you're the terrorist walking down the subway stairs with a bomb in your backpack and you see that the NYPD has set up a table at this subway stop and it's possible that they might stop you? Well, is there anything you could do about that? It's called turn around. <laughs> you walk back up the stairs and you go in the next subway stop. So it doesn't really seem that this is an incredibly effective way to stop terrorism. And what's the price that we pay? Well, the price Jungir Sultan is paying. Yeah, most other New Yorkers, you know, occasionally they're stopped and occasionally it takes them a little bit longer to get into the subway. But that apparently is a price that Americans are willing to pay. When the um, court ruled on the New York Civil Liberties Union's challenge, and this is a part of what we're up against too, if the president, if Congress, if the you know, people who run New the city of New York come up with schemes that are really more placebos than anything else, they're not really effective ways to fight terrorism. But I have one friend who says, I know this isn't going to prevent terrorism, but it makes me feel better. Yeah, OK. But if that happens, and if we're giving up somebody else's rights just because it makes some people feel better and people don't really mind, who do we want to count on in the, those circumstances? We want to count on the courts. We want to count on the courts to go to bat for the people whose rights we're willing to give up in order that we feel more secure. Well, here's what the Second Circuit said. New York put on an expert who claimed to be an expert in terrorist thinking and said, oh, well, you know, this isn't really about stopping the terrorism. We really recognize that the odds are pretty slim, but it will deter terrorists because the way the terrorists think, they really like certainty. And therefore, if they know that there's any chance that their plan might be disrupted and they'd have to go to the other subway stop, they won't do it. And therefore, this is a great deterrent. So the judges were at least honest enough to say, well, you know, we don't know if that's true. We're not terrorism experts, but you know, this is about terrorism. Hey, we'd better defer. And so they upheld the searches. You know, they say, oh, that, that's not an unreasonable search and seizure. OK, so we have a lot of themes going here. Let me give you two more examples of um, what's the racist fear mongering in the guise of counterterrorism. Um, the second example that I'm going to give you is uh, another client of the ACLU, the ACLU of Pennsylvania, a man named Eric Scherfen. Um, Eric was a veteran of the Gulf War, and while he was in the Gulf, one of the things that um, happened to him, which was a very good thing, was he was given sensitivity training. The military was actually trained in the Islamic religion so that they would understand what was going on in the region they were in, which is a great thing. So he became quite interested in Islam. And when he came back, after you know, he left the service, uh, he decided to study the Islamic religion more and really became quite intrigued. Another part of the story, he met a woman. And so the two of them now run an Islamic bookstore, and Eric actually converted to Islam. I have a photo of him in the book with his Apache helicopter looking like you know, Mr. All-American you know, commercial pilot, which is what he became after he left the service. So he's honorably discharged. He becomes a commercial pilot. One day, his employer says to him, you know, we're going to have to fire you if you can't get off the no-fly list. We really can't have a commercial pilot who's on the no-fly list. It's a problem. So, um, Eric, first, he, uh, I, I don't know if any of you have ever had airport problems. Anyone in the room ever had airport stories? You, you know, that, okay, you were hearing a lot of you know, you know, knowing chuckles and, and nods. So, you know, everybody knows airport stories about the security problems. So Eric tries, I have a picture in the middle of my book of the form that you get to fill out. The Department of Homeland Security has a re traveler's redress program where if you think you're on the no-fly list, you can fill out this form. I have the first page, which is really pretty you know, amazing bureaucratic form. And you write into them and you get what they call a redress control number. If you've seen that, if you're about to go on a flight, they say, do you have a redress control number? So they give you a number and then they um, presumably look into the situation. So this happened with Eric, and four months had passed by, and he hadn't yet heard anything about his complaint. And his employer was getting more and more anxious about whether or not he was going to get off the no-fly list or whether he was going to lose his job. So um, he, I finally ended up bringing a lawsuit with the help of the ACLU of Pennsylvania. And finally, after the four months, he receives this letter from the Department of Homeland Security. Okay, see if you can spot what critical information Eric is getting about what happened to him and why. Quote, 
In response to your inquiry concerning travel delays at the airline ticket counter or airport security checkpoint, we conducted a review of any applicable records in consultation with other federal agencies as appropriate. Where it was determined that a correction to records was warranted, those records were modified to address any delay or denial of boarding that you may have experienced as a result of the Transportation Security Administration's watch list screening process. What did Eric learn? Nothing. Okay, and that's where it ends up. You don't know if you were on the list. You don't know if you were off the list. Well, because Eric actually had a lawsuit going, there was a certain amount of you know, do discovery. There were documents that changed hands. And one thing that I think was an extremely interesting insight into how you get on a no-fly list was that one of Eric's co-workers, knowing that Eric was Muslim, reported to, I believe to the FBI, but it might have been somebody else and it ended up with the FBI, he reported that Eric was retrofitting his car to carry bombs. What was this based on? He had a, Eric had a broken seat in his car, which he was removing. Okay, we've recently seen, there was just a report about the uh, Freedom of Information Act, most recent lawsuit, which got a number of documents from the FBI about how they compile all these lists, all the watch lists, and the documents disclosed that there had been about 420,000 people on all the different watch lists, not that many on the no-fly list. Those numbers have fluctuated. And one interesting thing is that if the um, government hears a rumor, like you know, something like that about Eric, you know, you're, we believe you're retrofitting your car to carry bombs, or we're suspicious of you because, if you're cleared, if you're charged with a crime and you're cleared, you're acquitted, they don't take you off the list. That's their policy. They say, well, you know, just in case. So that's the whole idea. It's like the searches in the New York City um, subway system. Anything goes because there's some chance that if we lay out this great big dragnet, we might catch or deter a terrorist who we otherwise could not catch or deter. What about innocent people who are being disadvantaged? Well, you know, what a shame. Better to be safe than sorry. Eric Scherfen, we have all these watch lists. Yeah, you're on a watch list and you're just inconvenienced at the airport. Well, terribly sorry. Better to be safe than sorry. I actually, before telling you about um, my other ex well, examples, uh, I had another category, but I want to follow up on the, um, the no-fly lists because I think a lot of people say, too, you know, this is no big deal. Okay, so John Gere Sultan you know, was offended. It took him a little bit extra time to take the subway and he you know, took personal offense, but, you know, no big deal. Eric Scherfen, well, you know, he didn't actually lose his job. You know, the process worked. You know, maybe he had to litigate, but the process worked, and he did get off the no-fly list. So let me tell you about another case that the ACLU has pending now with a number of clients from around the country, which is a case brought on behalf of American citizens who have found themselves on the no-fly list and are unable to return to the country because they're living abroad. One of our clients, Amon Latif, another um, Gulf War veteran, he was disabled. And so he um, was living on disability benefits that he was getting from the Veterans Administration. He and his wife were living in Cairo, and they had a baby. They decided they wanted to bring the baby back home to visit the family, which lived in Florida. And at the same time, um, Amon was thinking of going to um, his visit to the Veterans Administration, where he was required to go back periodically so that they could check and, you know, his disability to see whether the level of benefits continued to be appropriate. So he arrives at the Cairo airport, and he's told that he and his wife are not allowed to get on the plane because he's on a no-fly list. Why? Only thing Amon can think of is he's a Muslim. You know, he had no clue you know, why they think you know, he's on the no-fly list. So what happens in a situation like this is if you're stuck abroad, you're effectively banished. You, know, you can't get home. So you can ask for somebody from the FBI to come and talk to you. So they dispatched some FBI agents who had a very long conversation with, um, with Amon. And at the end of that time, the FBI agent said, well, you know, we don't really see any problem with this guy. We think he's fine. We think he should be allowed to fly home. And somebody in Washington said no. And so, you know, there was Amon Latif. We end up bringing this lawsuit. When the lawsuit was brought, finally, you know, the lawyers on the other side, you know, squeaky wheeled, and he ended up being allowed to fly home on some temporary you know, um, you know, permission, some exceptional permission. What's going on in these cases? There was another um, client in a similar situation, Steve Washburn, who was in Ireland and found himself unable to fly back to the United States because of, he was on a no-fly list. FBI agents came to talk to him and after a long conversation said, well, you know, we don't really think there's any problem with you, but if they won't let you fly home, here's what you do. Fly to Mexico and walk into the country. <laughs> yeah, it's not that you're banished. You're allowed in the country. You just can't fly back. You can't fly to America or over any American airspace. What's going on in these cases? Well, you know, possibly. 
What this is all about is giving the FBI something to hold over people's heads so that they have to talk to them. These may just be people who they really wanted to interrogate. But you know, you can decline being interrogated if you're not, you know, there's no basis for suspecting you of any crime. But the way the no-fly lists are prepared, they're prepared in secret, behind closed doors, on the basis of information that can be as reliable as, oh, he's retrofitting his car to carry bombs. Okay, so there's example number two. Example number three, which I'm also gonna give you from the airport security context. Um, college student named Nick George, 22 years old, he lives in Philadelphia, and he's going to school at, he's about to start his senior year at Pomona College in Southern California. He's become very interested in things that have happened in the past decade, and so he's studying Middle Eastern studies. And as part of his studies, he's studying Arabic so that he can read documents and, and things in the original. So he decides, long flight from Philadelphia back to Southern California, he decides he's gonna study his Arabic English flashcards on the plane. Well, <laughs> okay, you see it coming, right? You know, those of you at the sanctuary here who know that art is suspect based on the ethnicity of the artist. Well, it turns out the Arabic language is suspect all by itself. Um, Nick, who was, 22, who was 22 at the time, was 14 on the date of 9-11. So the agent says to him, um, do you know who did 9-11? And Nick says, Osama bin Laden? And the agent says to him, that's right, and do you know what, what language he spoke? Now do you see why these cards are suspicious? Okay, you're laughing. Okay, what happened to Nick? He stopped laughing. Five hours, he was locked in a cell, he was handcuffed, he was put in a cell at the airport, the Philadelphia police were called in, he was interrogated, he was terrified, he missed his flight. Really serious. So what Nick did was he decided to fight back. He came to the ACLU, you know, the common ending to a lot of these stories, right? Where do you go? Uh, he came to the ACLU and, and brought a lawsuit so that this, wouldn't, you know, this kind of thing wouldn't happen to other people. His lawsuit is called Nick George versus TSA. And I have a picture of Nick in the book, you know, 22 years old and very bright-eyed, and really, like Jangir Sultan, just wanting to stand up for the principles here. It's not just what happened to them, but that they recognize that these are things that can happen to other people. Well, um, in some ways, I've been on a book tour going around the country talking about this book, and I feel a little bit like Cassandra because I feel like I'm sort of t explaining to people how um, what's really going on in the guise of anti-terrorism is really, it's much more than you ever would have known. You, did you know about these stories? Any of you? Probably not, and you most of them. And there are other things I'm going to tell you about um, in the next little bit that I think are, some of them are going to be surprising to you, areas where you really didn't know things that are going on. So I thought that maybe right at the beginning, before getting into some more of the things that are happening in other areas and what I, what I think is really deeply going on, I thought I would start with the other part of the Sanctuary for Independent Media's sentence here, racist fear-mongering in the guise of counterterrorism and what, quote, ordinary folks can do to fight back. Well, I've already told you about Nick George and Eric Scherfen and Imam Latif and John Gere Sultan and how they fought back by you deciding to litigate, by deciding to go to the ACLU and get a lot of publicity about what happened to them. But there are a lot of other heroes in this story. And since we're at the Sanctuary for Independent Media, I want to talk about you know, who some of these people are. Some of the heroes are the press, you know, the media, the press, the artists, the people who bring things to the public's attention in any form, tell the stories, get publicity get the American people to understand what's happening to the Nick Georges and the John Gere Sultans. There have been reporters at the New York Times, like James Risen and Eric Lichtblau, who blew the whistle on that National Security Agency spying program that President Bush had put into effect for years, despite the fact that it was just flat out illegal under the current law. He just had this secret spying program. Those reporters were asked, the New York Times was begged by the government not to release this story on the ground that it would compromise national security. And they flinched some. They held up the story for a year, including the year in which George W. Bush was reelected. But after that, they just decided, well, you know, they just couldn't do that. It was just too important that the public know what was going on. So they published the story. There was a follow-up story by a reporter from USA Today, also about secret government surveillance program, programs. There's a story that I want to tell you more background of in, in a little bit, written by a Washington Post reporter called Barton Gelman, exposing the whole world of national security letters, which is another story altogether. So there are all these reporters, all these media. There are also military figures, you know, um, high ups in the military, you know, generals, especially retired military figures who were relieved of you know, being 
in, in kind of the line of fire, who really stood up to object to what we were doing in the way of enhanced interrogation techniques and you know, other things that were going on that they just thought were wrong. So they stood up. And I think that um, maybe the, the group of people who I want to focus on now are the people, the, the lovers of books. Yeah, you're here because you're interested in books. I wrote a book because I think that's a good way to talk about things. Um, I was, just last week, as part of my book tour, I was in one of the great bookstores in the country, Powell's in Portland, Oregon. If you ever go to Portland, you have, you have, you'll love it. It's a city of books. So uh, one of the, they had a, a sort of goldfish bowl near the door on the way in where they had these little buttons that you could take and wear if you were a book lover. Some of them said things like Holden Caulfield for president. One just said freedom. And the one that I picked up, because it relates to what I want to tell you about, it says Thomas Jefferson was a bookworm. Now, I'm sure that you recall that in the fall of 2001, when the USA Patriot Act, whose 10th anniversary we're just about to observe, I won't say celebrate, observe, uh, was put into effect, among the first people to really sound the alarm that maybe not everything in that Patriot Act was necessary to counteract terrorism and a good idea, among the first people to sound the alarm were the librarians. One of the other kinds of stories I tell in one of my chapters, I have two chapters on the librarians, um, and the first, first one begins by telling a little bit about the history of public libraries in this country, because it turns out that the connection between books and librarians and our democracy is very deep and very old. So uh, Benjamin Franklin started the first lending library in this, company, in this country. He and his friends in Philadelphia read so quickly and couldn't afford all the books they wanted to read, so they decided to exchange books with each other. And that became the Library Company of Philadelphia. They were just all exchanging their books. Well, Franklin, as you know, was considered to be a very great American and was very you know, admired by people in the country. And so there was a town in Massachusetts that decided that it wanted to honor Benjamin Franklin by naming itself Franklin. Now, evidently, one reason to name your town after somebody who's still alive is, at least in those days, the person who you were honoring was expected to you know, give you something in exchange for the honor. So the people in it would be Franklin, Massachusetts, wrote to Benjamin Franklin, and they said, we're naming the town in your honor. How about if you send us a new church bill? Well, so sometime later, they get a great big heavy box from Benjamin Franklin, and they think, oh, good, here's our new church bill. So they open it up, and it's not a church bill. It's a big box of books. Uh, what Benjamin Franklin has said to them is, sense is better than sound. So Franklin claims to be the first place in the country to have a public library, because then they had to figure out what to do with all those books they'd gotten from Benjamin Franklin. And what they decided to do was share them with everyone in the town, just open up a library and have everybody come and be able to look at the books. Thomas Jefferson was such a great bookworm that he had an enormous collection of books. When the British burned down the Library of Congress during the War of 1812, how did the Library of Congress restart? Thomas Jefferson gave them some of his books. He had so many, his collection was enough to start up the Library of Congress again. Okay, so that is our intellectual tradition of librarians really understanding the connections between ideas, people who read, people who think, and democracy. One of the biggest problems in the fall of 2001 was I think we kind of got on the wrong track because the American people were convinced that a number of things must be true because this is what everybody kept saying to us. The first thing that we were told was that you have to give up some of your liberty in order to be safe. Remember that one? Well, you know, it's just not, you know, not business as normal anymore. You have to give up some of your liberty. Furthermore, the government should be able to do everything it's doing in secret, because if we tell our enemies what we're doing, then they're going to be able to adapt and we'll be less safe. So they just have to do everything in secret. Therefore, premise number three, we just have to trust the government, because if they tell us enough for us to make the decisions, then we're going to be less safe, and therefore we just have to let them make all the decisions. Do you remember the famous words of President Bush, I'm the decider? Okay, is he the decider? We're the deciders. Okay, so you know, that's, you know, kind of, it, that's my um, subtitle, The Erosion of American Democracy. This isn't even just about people's rights and whether people are being inconvenienced and having a problem in their lives. It's really about changing the sort of basic underlying conditions of democracy, that the president gets to decide everything. Okay, it continues from there. We'd better give the president great big dragnets of all sorts, surveillance dragnets to find out what everybody is doing, just in case we're going to find out what you know, bad people are doing. And are we going to get innocent people? Well, you know, why should anybody care if the government knows what you're doing if you're not doing anything wrong? 
Okay, you know, again, you, know, you you're seeing <laughs> that there is in fact a problem with you know, we'll maybe talk about that later. Um, finally, the president has to do this, and neither the courts nor Congress should get involved because really they might get it wrong. The president probably knows more than they do, and therefore we just have to trust the president to wield all the dragnets. The president isn't interested in finding out who's reading a biography of Osama bin Laden in the library. The president is only interested in terrorists. Okay, there's at least actually one documented case where the FBI went to a librarian in Washington State and asked for the identities of people who had checked out a particular biography of Osama bin Laden. So sometimes you know, the, the fear-mongering, the racist fear-mongering in the guise of counterterrorism does connect up the things we're not supposed to be interested in and the things we are interested in. Okay, so this is the entire mindset. There's this whole series of assumptions. And if you talk to a lot of people in this country, I suspect probably not most of you in this room, they'll say, well, you know, we're doing great. After all, there hasn't been another major terrorist attack, so it must be that everything in the Patriot Act was the right thing, and we don't want to give up any of those powers because it's better to be safe than sorry. Now, my premise is that that's one reason that that's too easy to say is that they think it's mostly going to be the rights of other people. It's going to be Jangir Sultan and people who are Muslims and not us, which is wrong. And another reason, I think, is that they don't really see what the costs are. They think that this is all free. A reporter just said to me today, well, you know, when I go camping, even if I don't think it's going to be cold, I bring a fleece. Better safe than sorry. Okay, so this isn't just you. You're bringing a fleece and you have one more thing to pack. It's a matter of the harm that we're doing. And at a time when we actually don't really know what we're getting, what kinds of benefits we're getting from a lot of these measures. So I want to tell you about two different parts of the Patriot Act, uh, because these were two of the most controversial parts. One was controversial immediately, and this was the part that the librarians first objected to. Uh, it, it was called, it was Section 215, and it came to be known as the library provision, which I'll call it because the librarians brought attention to it. So here's what the library provision did and what it's compared to. Let me start with the Fourth Amendment. So many of you know that the Fourth Amendment is the part of the Bill of Rights that says that we have the right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures. Government cannot just come into your basement and see what you're doing, see what you're reading, see whether you have seditious literature. The framers cared a lot about that. Uh, in order to do that, in order to search your home, in order to arrest you, the government, first of all, has to have a good reason, usually called probable cause. That's you know, the sort of default. And second, the government has to convince somebody objective that they do have a good enough reason. And that's the, sort of the idea behind the warrant requirement. So typically, if the government wants to search your house or you know, take things out of your house, they have to go to a judge and they have to say, OK, here's why. We want to go to this person's house and what we think we're going to find. And then the judge will say yes or no. They'll review it and say, well, you know, okay, I think that's a good enough reason. And then they'll put some limit on the search. They'll say, okay, you can search. And since you're searching for the elephant stolen from the zoo, you're not allowed to search in the person's medicine cabinets. Okay, so th this whole idea that you're going to have a second opinion is something I think that's very familiar to most of us because if you're going to do something important in your own life, if you're thinking of having an operation, you want a second opinion. Okay, so the idea of the framers who wrote the Fourth Amendment is this is important. If we're going to allow the government to poke around your house and see what you're thinking and what you're writing and what you're saying and you know, who your family is and what's going on inside your house, inside your mind, inside your books, really, we should have some limitation on the government. Yes, they can do it if they have a good enough reason. But if they don't have a reason, if they're just fishing, or if it's possible that they're just going to be targeting their political opponents, or people who they're suspicious of, because perhaps because of racist fear-mongering, they shouldn't just be able to do that at will. Just too much discretion is not a good thing. Okay, you can hear already the conflict between that idea, too much discretion is not a good thing, and the basic concept of the Patriot Act, let's give the government lots of discretion, and let's let them just decide what to do with it. So, here's what the library provision said. The library provision says, and it's not only libraries, the library provision says if a government agent wants to find out what's in your records, they can go to any custodian of your records and say, give us the records, and all the, or tangible things, whatever they want. All they have to do is they have to go to this secret court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, and they have to fill out an affidavit that says, we believe we're going to find information relevant to a terrorism investigation. At that point, what the Patriot Act says is, the court must issue the order. Is that judicial review? What's the point of going to a court? To me, this, it's a fig leaf. You know, that's not really a court order. The court doesn't have any choice. The government decides whether it thinks it has enough reason to search. 
Okay, so people say, oh, but you know, isn't this a good thing? Because really, you know, after 9-11, we want to be in preventive mode. We just want to allow the government to search wherever they want. Why should they have to have a reason? Well, you know, there are reasons to be concerned about that. Um, the other thing I'll tell you, however, is that even if the library provision hadn't lowered this standard by making it really, really easy for the government to get anybody's records from your librarians, schools, hospitals, social work agencies, your internet service provider. Okay, is, are the words cloud computing meaning anything to anyone here? How much does your internet service provider have access to about your life at this point? Everything. Your photographs, your calendars, your contact, it's all stored up on the cloud. It's not stored in your own computer anymore. So what this provision of the Patriot Act does is it makes your entire life visible to the government as long as they fill out the affidavit and say to the court, oh, we think we're gonna find something relevant to a terrorism investigation. You notice they don't have to be suspicious of you. They just have to assert that they think they're gonna find something that's useful, not necessarily that you're a terrorist. Um, without this provision, when the government has to go to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court to get their approval of searches, wiretapping telephones, etc., the court approves 99 point something percent of all the government's requests. So this is not exactly a tough court. It's not as if if you had the court actually give a second opinion, they were gonna say no a whole lot. So this is, you know, it's a very overbroad provision. Well, the librarians were very concerned about this because they really didn't like the idea that the government could come to them and start saying, okay, who's been checking out biographies of Osama bin Laden? Yeah, there's a famous, maybe apocryphal story about a little boy who was doing a school report on dams and the FBI ends up you know, on his doorstep because he had checked out a book about dams and maybe he was a terrorist. You just, you know, all sorts of concerns. So the librarians are raising these concerns about the library provision and how this really is exposing people's reading habits and all sorts of things about our lives to the government without enough protection against arbitrary and discriminatory searches. And some of you may recall the Attorney General at the time, John Ashcroft, and he said, and this was not very popular at the time, given that most librarians in this country are women, he said, oh, this is just baseless hysteria. Those librarians are just being hysterical. You know, there's no reason for concern here. So he kept saying that, and the librarians kept saying, well, wait a minute, you know, there is a reason for concern. You know, we have a right to privacy of thought. We have these intellectual traditions. In fact, let me tell you about an earlier incident that had happened when the government tried to enlist librarians in, um, their own project. This is a Cold War program, and it was called the Library Awareness Program. Anyone ever hear about this? I'd never heard about this before I was doing this research. So it was a Cold War program, and what happened was that the FBI asked librarians to please keep track. Oh, thank you. To please keep track of foreigners from communist countries and what books they were checking out. So this is part of our whole enterprise of trying to keep track of what the Soviet Union is doing which, you know, all, exceptions to all the rules about surveillance for the Soviet Union. You didn't have to have any reason to spy on them and see what they were doing in their embassy. So librarians were being asked to keep track of all this kind of thing. Well, familiar part of the story, the New York Times in 1987 published a story saying, hey, you know, wait a minute, did anybody know that we have this thing going on? The librarians were in an uproar. They said, this is terrible. I have quotes from the person who was the head of the New York Library Association at the time, and she said, you know, librarians aren't trained to figure out who's a spy. You know, this isn't what we do, this is ridiculous. So the public was so outraged by this that 48 states passed laws saying, wait a minute, you know, librarians should not be giving up people's records to anybody who asks unless, unless you have a real court order. We wanna protect library records, they're special. Not they're sacrosanct. Not the government can never find out, but the government should have to have a good reason to want to look at your library records, and they should have to convince a neutral court that they do have a good reason. Okay, so 48 states, plus in the other two states, the attorneys general did pretty much the same thing. So this is unanimous. Every state in the country thinks that library records should be special and should be protected. There are other laws that grant special privacy to educational records, to medical records, to telecommunications records. And this was sort of you know, a general societal agreement that we don't want the government to just be able to find out all about anybody just by going and saying, you know, tell us what that person is doing. So all these laws are in effect. Well, what is the library provision doing in the Patriot Act? The point of the library provision is to sweep all of those state laws out of the way. Can the federal government do that? You bet. One of the most powerful parts of the federal constitution is the supremacy clause. Sometimes that's a great thing, right? The federal government can say to Mississippi, please stop lynching people. 
if they had ever done that. But on the other hand, it also means that the federal government under the Patriot Act can come into your library and say, we don't care about your state privacy law. Give us the information. Okay, so the librarians are kicking up quite a fuss about this, and they're getting some public attention here. A lot of people are getting very concerned about, well, wait a minute, well, what is happening here? We do think that what people think and what books they check out is important and should be private and shouldn't just be subject to whatever the government wants to, you know, to do. So finally, there was enough public pressure because librarians, it turns out, are not quite as quiet as their stereotype. So John Ashcroft finally said, all right, all right, I'm going to declassify information about how often we've used this provision. The answer is we haven't. Satisfied? Okay, so, you know, that's nice. So it turns out that, um, it, in retrospect, it turns out the reason the provision hadn't been used is that the uh, agencies involved were just gearing up their procedures and they, they sort of hadn't really started yet figuring out how to use this new power, which by now they certainly have. So um, in, this was one of the provisions, this library provision was one of 16 provisions in the original Patriot Act that Congress understood was controversial. And because they passed the Patriot Act just six weeks after 9-11, and they didn't take the time to have debates or testimony or hearings or any nice things like that, 16 provisions, they said, well, you know, we're really not so sure about this, so we'll give it four years and we'll see how it turns out. And after four years, if we don't renew the provision, it will expire. So that meant that in 2005, those 16 provisions expired, and then Congress had to decide whether or not to renew them. Well, at the 2005 renewal hearings, testifying about the library provision, Attorney General, now Gonzalez, testified before Congress and he said, well, the library provision has only so far been used 25 times, 35 times, sorry, and has never been used in a library. Ha, so there. The librarians are still being hysterical. There's really no problem. Well, this was all very nice, except there were a lot of librarians around the country who were really scratching their heads because they had had the FBI come to them and ask for information. This happened to George Christian, one of the heroes of my book, the ordinary American who stood up and defended freedom. I have a picture of him, too. You can see very square-jawed. Looks great. Um, George Christian is one of the people who's he's involved in this place called Library Connection of Connecticut, which provides all sorts of internet services to a consortium of libraries in Connecticut. Now, how many of you have been in a library lately that did not have a computer? Okay, that's one of the things that libraries are doing, right? People don't only do their research through books, so they all have computers. Therefore, they're covered by all these laws about telecommunications providers. So, George Christian was part of you know, a group of librarians in Connecticut who were trying to figure out how to respond to this library provision because they were very concerned that the FBI might come and ask them not only about books, but you know, who was using the computers. And librarians all over the country are discussing this. Well, you know, can we tell Congress that we're concerned about this? You know, should we have procedures of what we should do if the FBI comes? Should we stop keeping certain kinds of records so that we, they won't be available and then we won't have to make the decision of whether to turn them over? And they're all talking about all this. And then they hear, Attorney General Ashcroft and Attorney General Gonzalez saying, oh, you know, we're not using this in libraries. And George Christian said to me, well, you know, we relaxed. We trusted them, but we shouldn't have. So one day, George Christian, after they've sort of decided, well, they don't need to spend the money and hire a lawyer to try to figure out what to do if, he's standing across the street from the tennis courts in Mattituck, Connecticut, and an FBI agent comes up to him and serves him with a national security letter. I quote the national security letter in the book, sounds very bureaucratic on this FBI stationery, and what it says is, give us information about the people who used a computer terminal in one of the Connecticut libraries on the following day. Okay, just a demand. No court order, none at all, just the FBI issues this, and furthermore, and this is something that applies to the library provision too, when the FBI goes to a librarian or whoever and says, give us the information, the second part of the order is not only give it to us, we're demanding the information, but a gag order. You are never allowed to tell anybody that we asked you anything about this. Not a word. Okay, so George Christian is a little upset about this and doesn't quite know what to do. Uh, one thing he told me was that he was very concerned about, well, what if this really is an emergency and the FBI really is on the track of somebody who's about to blow something up? And after thinking hard about this, he decided that that wasn't the case because the letter had been dated several months before it was served on him. And the FBI agent had actually called the office to say, now, what, what name should we put in the top of this letter? And then waited a number of days before serving the letter. So George concluded that this probably was not a real emergency situation and that he actually had time to think about whether he wanted to do something about this. So 
He decided to go to a lawyer. He went to a lawyer who I th think worked for the, on the uh, faculty of the University of Connecticut. Lawyer had never heard of national security letters. Fortunately, the lawyer had a law student do some research, and the law student found that there had been one case about national security letters. Now I'm going to tell you about this case. I'm going to switch gears from George Christian for a minute and tell you about the person who preceded George Christian. The case that the student found was called John Doe versus, actually first it was called John Doe versus Ashcroft, then it was called John Doe versus Gonzalez, then it was called John Doe versus Mukasey, then it was called John Doe versus Holder. This case lasted for six years, but one part of it had already been decided by the time George Christian was asking his lawyer about what could be done about this. Well, what had happened in this case was this was a case involving an internet service provider in New York. Um, I'm gonna tell you his name because I'm now finally allowed to. For six years ago, for six years while this litigation was pending, he was not allowed to tell anybody that he was the person bringing this litigation. But we now know his name after six years of litigation. His name is Nicholas Merrill. He ran an internet service company and had, was doing very well. He had very big clients, including Ikea and Snapple and Democracy Now. You've had Amy Goodman here. So he was doing very well. So he gets one day, the FBI comes to him, and they serve him with a national security letter. And it says, give us information about one of your clients and never, ever tell anyone. Well, Nick had studied the Fourth Amendment. He had taken a constitutional law class at Hampshire College, and he said the first thing that he noticed that really you know, bothered him was that there was no court signature. It had never been to a judge. It was just the FBI saying, give us the information. So he didn't think that was right, because this is important private information about you know, what internet service providers know. And the second thing that really bothered him was the idea of the gag order. He didn't like that idea that he wasn't allowed to tell anybody and you know, that this was an experience. And at that time, the gag order was written in absolute terms. It said, never tell anyone, period. Threat of federal prosecution. Exception if you want to talk to your lawyer? No. Exception if you want to go to court and challenge it and say, this is really burdensome. How can they be asking me for this much information? No. Exception if you want to testify before Congress and say, wait a minute, do you know this? No. No exceptions. So Nick was brave enough to come first to the New York Civil Liberties Union, and he told me that when he met a lawyer for, the, for his lawyer for the first time, he said, so if I challenge the government on this, is someone going to put me in a sack and drag me away? And the lawyer said to him, I can't tell you what's going to happen. <laughs> and Nick decided he was going to go ahead anyway because he's just that iconoclastic. So he challenged the gag order, he challenged the national security letter, and he kept going for six years. Imagine for six years not being allowed to tell anyone that you're bringing this litigation. Nick is pretty irreplaceable, and he wrote an, an op-ed in the Washington Post in 2007. He wrote it under the name John Doe, because he wasn't allowed to tell anyone who he was. And here's what he talks about, about how it was to live under this prolonged regimen of silence. He says, when I meet with my attorneys, I cannot tell my girlfriend where I am going or where I have been. I hide any papers related to the case where she will not look. They ended up breaking up. She thought he was hiding something from her. When clients and friends ask me whether I am the one challenging the constitutionality of the NSL statute, I have no choice but to look them in the eye and lie. Okay, so Nick put up with that for six years while he was litigating. But meanwhile, back at George Christian and the library connection, okay, so they find out about this case, and the lawyer says to George Christian, well, you know, if you're troubled with this order, really your only choice is to do what Nick, what John Doe did, I don't know his name, what John Doe did and challenge, you know, go to court and challenge this. So George Christian decides he's interested in doing this, but he has a problem. Any of you serve on boards? Anything? Okay. He has a board of directors at Library Connection, and he's not allowed to tell them what he's doing. Now, how do you commit an organization to your know, possible penalties, all the expense of litigation, etc., without consulting your board of directors? So what George decided to do was to split the difference. He thought what he, who he really needed to tell was the executive committee of the board of directors. So he told his three fellow officers, who are now like the library connection four, and they all totally agreed with George. Yeah. Um, he said, one of the things that was most upsetting to him was that Attorney General Gonzalez is here telling Congress, oh, your library records are safe. And he said, library records are not safe. It turns out the librarians were focused on the wrong provision. Under the national security letters, the government can't get as much information. They can't actually get the content of the records and know who checked out the biography of Osama bin Laden under that section. But they can get a whole bunch of other information. They can get name, address, user information, and this has fluctuated over time. There have been different understandings. But 
They, can, um, they have gotten, at some points, all of the websites that somebody's visited, all of their to and from email addresses, not the content of the email, but the addresses. Now, this is already problematic, right? How do you separate the address from the whole email? I know a magistrate judge who kind of you know, really tried to oversee that, and you're talking about what keystrokes and how, how do you do that. So anyway, but the point was you could get all of this information with no court order, whatever. It's just totally self-help. Well, so George Christian and his three colleagues decided that they were going to bring a challenge too, and their first goal was that the, the renewal hearings for the Patriot Act were still going on, and they wanted to take part. George said, I, I wanted to tell Congress that people's library records are not safe. The government said, you know, when, when George asked, you know, the lawyer asked the government, well, can, can they testify in Congress? The answer was no. It's a gag order. He's not allowed to tell. Well, so we're litigating now whether or not it is permissible for a citizen to testify before Congress, to tell Congress how powers are being used that evidently Congress is not that aware of. Well, here's where Barton Gelman comes in. Barton Gelman finds out about this case, and he actually figures out you know, who the people are who are involved. And he writes an expose in November of 2005, describing George Christian's experience at a time when George Christian was not allowed when everyone called him up to say, yes, that's right, it's me. He had to say, who me? What? Where? Yeah, I'm not answering the phone. Uh, so, Barton Gelman talks about the national security letters, and it turns out that this thing that the librarians didn't know about, compared to the 35 times that the library provision has been used never in libraries, you want to know how many times the national security letters had already been used? Tens of thousands of times a year. There have been hundreds of thousands of requests of telecommunications providers, et cetera, under the national security letters. Okay, so this is really big business. There's a lot of information. Do you know? whether anybody has looked at your records from you know, any people under either provision to just see whether it's going to lead them to anything. You don't. Okay, so a lot of people say, well, I know where's the harm then if we don't know? Okay, so tremendous ability of the government to gather information under both of these sections. Uh, I'll actually tell you, because we're talking about the press a little some here too, the very enterprising reporters involved in many of these stories. So there's a New York Times reporter who actually f figures out the identity of the people in the library connection who are bringing this lawsuit because some government lawyer has done a very bad job at redacting the documents that are put up on, on the website, and it says the name of one of the people, so you know she figures this out. So she publishes a story in the New York Times saying, oh, you know, you know John Doe is the library connection of Connecticut, and blah, 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 and you know, this whole story. Well, after that, George Christian and his colleagues go into court and they say, okay, well, you know, could we please testify before Congress now that everybody knows who we are? You know, it's really hard to argue that, you know, the cat is already out of the bag. Well, the government being absolutely set on the great need for secrecy here and the fact that this was going to compromise national security says no. So what they do is they take the document down from the court's website and they redact it more carefully so it leaves out the information that it slipped and they oppose the motion before the, the court to let these people testify before Congress. In arguing that the cat was not in fact out of the bag, the government resorted to some pretty extreme arguments. They argued, they, sh they cited some polls showing that 58% of people don't necessarily believe what they read in newspapers. And then they also argued that nobody in Connecticut reads the New York Times. <laughs> so still, the you know, Library Connection for are not permitted to testify before Congress. Finally, the Congress, looking at the result in the original John Doe case, what happened in our internet service provider John Doe case was that a very courageous judge in the Southern District of New York, Victor Marrero, looks at this whole thing, and he seems to have heard of the First Amendment. So when John Doe versus Ashcroft is first filed, the ACLU wants to post on our website just an announcement that this case has been filed and explaining what national security letters are and why we think they're unconstitutional. Nobody ever, not George Christian, not Nick Merrill, nobody ever wanted to say, oh, here's what the government wanted to know, here's the person they're suspicious of. You know, everybody got that. Yeah, that you can't say. But to say, you know, the FBI came to me and it was upsetting, or, you know, I think there's the gag orders, whatever it is they wanted to say. So the government argues that it is not permissible for the ACLU to have any information on its website mentioning that this lawsuit exists. So Judge Marrero then has to arbitrate well, what about the docket entries? Are you, are you allowed to publish the docket entries? And just this very deep urge for secrecy that I think is so central to the whole story of what happened after 
Well, in light of um, the decision that Judge Marrero had reached saying the gag order just has to be unconstitutional, it's permanent, it's too broad, it's in every case, it's forever, you know, maybe sometimes it's justified, but not every single case always permanently. So Congress to look, took a look at that, and one of the very few places where they've modified any provisions of the Patriot Act, they wrote into the law, well, oh, oh okay, yeah, well, of course you can consult a lawyer, that's okay. And they have this tiny little escape route where you can ask the court for permission to divulge something about your experience, except, <laughs> not too big an exception, because if the government says no, that's the end of it. So once again, you notice the theme, the court doesn't get to decide, the deciders get to decide. Okay, well, so there's the story of the library connection and um, our other John Doe. People who stood up, you know, imagine, you, this is really heroic, these people, you know, what they underwent and their commitment to just wanting to defend the principle. This wasn't about they were being harmed. This was just that they get the Constitution and they got the importance of the privacy of people's records. So what, what is the harm then of you know, provisions like this? Well, after Barton Gilman's article in the Washington Post, Congress finally woke up, you know, they sort of became aware of the national security letters and they decided, well, maybe it would be an interesting thing to do a little oversight over what the, how the government was using all these powers. And they commissioned a report from the Inspector General of the Department of Justice to say, oh, you could you just look into how that's going? So the Inspector General came up for the first time with the full numbers, how many hundreds of thousands of times this had happened. But here's the other thing that the Inspector General discovered. The big idea of the Patriot Act is who needs the court to supervise what, what the FBI is doing? We don't need the courts, and we don't need Congress because this is all too secret. The way we're going to do this is we're just going to make sure that the upper people, the higher echelons in the Department of Justice, are supervising their own agency. And therefore, you know, they'll just do regulations, they'll be careful, and we'll just trust the superiors to make sure that the line people don't do, do anything wrong. So there were all sorts of regulations that the FBI was supposed to follow, and they were answerable to themselves, to each other. And what the Inspector General discovered, I think, is surprising to nobody who <laughs> believes in the basic constitutional structure of checks and balances. When the FBI was using this power behind closed doors and they didn't have to ask anybody, and they didn't have to report to anybody, and they didn't think that they were going to be accountable, and they only had to follow their own regulations, they racked up thousands of violations of their own regulations. And in a second report, the Inspector General said, furthermore, they've gotten so careless about this. Everyone just says, yes, sir, yes, sir, when they come and say, we want information. So they got to the point where they didn't even bother to issue national security letters, which were too formal. They started asking telecommunications providers, give us a list of all the telephone numbers that this person has called. And they would do it by post-it or by an email. Okay, so the Inspector General reports all this to Congress, and Congress has a hearing, very unusual in all this area, and the FBI's counsel says to Congress, okay, we get that this is an F report card. Yeah, we get that. We're going to do better. We promise. Just trust us. Okay, so there we are. The national security letters go on. Okay, another very important question here. What I'm telling you about under the Patriot Act began under the Bush administration. What about the fact that George Bush is no longer in the White House? Well, a lot of people around the country who I've spoken to says, well, you know, oh, that Patriot Act stuff, oh, you know, that's so Bush administration. You know, we're not worried about that anymore. Well, Barack Obama, when he was campaigning for pre the presidency, one of the things he said in one of his speeches is no more national security letters. That's un-American. Okay, you want to know what his position is now that he's president? Trust me. Of course you couldn't trust him, but you can trust me. I'm not going to use the powers against the wrong people. Good for me to have the dragnets because I'm trustworthy. Now, people sometimes say to me, okay, so what's going on? Was he lying? Or is it just that he knows all this secret information now, so he knows that these powers really are necessary? And I think neither of the above. I think, I like to say, he changed his position when his position changed. He's president now. You know, and it's natural human instinct to think that you're trustworthy. You're not going to use the powers in a bad way. Okay, the laws under the Patriot Act will allow you to prosecute the Red Cross. There's actually no protection. But is Barack Obama going to prosecute the Red Cross? Of course not. So he might as well have this enormous power. Now, what's a little discouraging about this, I think that any president, it's not just Obama, you know, it was George Bush, it was Bill Clinton. Many of the things I describe in the book began before 9-11, and some of them began with Bill Clinton. It was Franklin Roosevelt during World War II, agreeing to lock up all the Japanese Americans. It was Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, agreeing to suspend, or deciding to suspend habeas corpus. 
There's an interesting book by Jack Goldsmith, who was in the, the belly of the beast. He was in the D D Justice Department while all this was going on. And he wrote a book called The Terror Presidency. And he said what I think is right. He said any president in the middle of you, this idea of the war on terror is not going to be willing to relinquish powers that the American people think might be useful in stopping terrorism. So it's just not going to happen. The president isn't doing it. Congress isn't doing it. The courts aren't doing it. I'll tell you more about the courts later if you want to know about that during Q&A. So what I just want to do quickly now is I want to give you two more examples of how these dragnets work. Um, one is the material support laws, which I briefly mentioned. The idea of material support laws is why wait for a terrorist to commit an act? Why wait for a terrorist to commit an attempted act? Why wait for a terrorist to be involved in a conspiracy where we can prosecute them if we can punish them before and prevent them from doing what they're doing? Okay, now the whole problem with this preventive paradigm is again, you're gonna get a lot of innocent people and you're gonna get a lot of things that never were gonna happen. Uh, there have been people prosecuted, and my first chapter tells the story of a graduate student at the University of Idaho who was prosecuted for material support of terrorism. They thought they had found a sleeper cell in Idaho because he posted links on a website to jihadist speech. It was like, you know, you want to know what jihadists say about themselves? Okay, here's a link. Did he believe it? No. Did the law require that the FBI, that the prosecutor had approved that he believed it? No. All these laws allow people to be prosecuted for providing material support to terrorists, even if you don't intend to support terrorist activity, just because in one way or the other you've gotten too close to terrorists. The provision now, which is very vague, says you can't provide effective, um, what's it, where you can't provide expert advice or assistance to a, a terrorist or a terrorist group. When you look at the definition, and the Supreme Court just had a case on this, which if you don't know about this, you won't believe it. It's a case called Humanitarian Law Project. The Humanitarian Law Project people, based in California, are peace activists. And what they do is they try to talk to would-be terrorists around the world and convince them to use peaceful dispute resolution mechanisms instead of being terrorists. So they particularly work with the Kurds in Turkey. And they say to the Kurds in Turkey, OK, we get that you have grievances against the Turkish government. Here's how you can go to the UN. Here's where you can go. Here are things that you can do. You don't need to become terrorists. OK, good idea. Sounds pretty reasonable, right? Well, after the Patriot Act expanded this material support idea to say you can prosecute somebody for providing expert advice or assistance to terrorists, in other words, if the idea was let's make all terrorist groups radioactive, the people at Humanitarian Law Project started to worry. Well, could this apply to us? Could that mean that the government is going to come after us and that we shouldn't be telling our donors that they can give us money for doing what we're doing because they're participating and violating the law because we're not making these terrorists retroactive, we're talking to them? So they end up bringing a lawsuit that, again, you know, like 10 years of litigation back and forth in and out, ends up in the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court thinks this is a pretty easy case, uh, six to three, only three justices dissenting. The Supreme Court says, are you covered by the statute? Of course. That's expert advice or assistance. You're teaching terrorists how to use peaceful dispute resolution mechanisms, and therefore, they don't have to spend their own money figuring out how to use peaceful dispute resolution mechanisms, and therefore, they have more money to buy bombs. Of course, you're covered. Next question, does that violate the First Amendment, that you're not allowed to talk to people who the government thinks might be terrorists? Oh, that doesn't violate the First Amendment. Is it about your speech? Sure, but whether you're allowed to speak depends what you want to say. The government says it's important to prevent terrorism, to make these terrorist groups, anybody who they think is a terrorist, radioactive. There um, is a lawyer who was working for the ACLU of Northern California who is from Sri Lanka. Originally, his family is still in Sri Lanka. So he was in Sri Lanka visiting for vacation when the tsunami came. And so he was working with relief organizations to try to get humanitarian aid, just you know, food, housing, et cetera, to people around the country who had been displaced by the tsunami. And what he said was, at the time, a terrorist group that our government has designated as one of the worst of the worst, no longer around, the Tamil Tigers, they ran a fifth of the country. And because they were in charge of a fifth of the country that they had taken over, they were the government for that fifth of the country. So there was no way to get humanitarian aid to anybody in that part of the country without working with the Tamil Tigers. Anybody in a humanitarian group who's working with the Tamil Tigers subject to prosecution under this statute? Sure. It's just an enormous dragnet. What harm does it do? I'm sure if we asked Barack Obama, I'm sure he would say to us, I'm not going to prosecute the Red Cross, oh, come on. But I need this really broad power, because what if? What if it's the only way to get at a terrorist? So what harm does this statute do if, in fact, 
the Red Cross is not prosecuted. Well, it seems to me that this statute, the material support statute, saying don't get anywhere near a terrorist, even if you're a humanitarian or trying to teach them how to be peaceful, don't take out the book of or the biography of Osama bin Laden if you think that's going to raise the government's eyebrows and they might find out. Don't go to a mosque because the FBI might have sent an infiltrator there to watch what you're doing. It has a tremendous chilling effect. It means that people are afraid to take out the biography of Osama bin Laden. They're certainly afraid to donate to a Muslim charity because the Muslim charities have been regarded as entirely suspect. Whole other story. Um, and they're afraid to give humanitarian aid. The charities in this country have been made to jump through hoops, as have businesses. In addition to imposing all sorts of obligations on charities, businesses have been conscripted to help find information about it. Any of you in financial services institutions, banks, et cetera? The Patriot Act has a very broad um, definition of what financial services are, which includes not only banks and securities places, but uh, car rental agencies and jewelry stores. And they sort of got that list from money laundering ideas. And anybody in any of these businesses has to uh, fill out, they have to abide by this very elaborate know your customer routine. And they have to get information about their customers that will then be available to the government. There are suspicious activity reports that they're invited to file with the government if they, they're suspicious of anybody. Um, they're, supposed to, they're expected to follow all sorts of watch lists. They can't do business with anybody who's on a government watch list. And the watch lists, as I said, have so many names that you can't follow that unless you buy Patriot Act compliance software, which is a whole other business that has been generated. So the businesses are just jumping through all sorts of hoops. What is this based on? What is the witch hunt against the Muslim charities based on? In the fall of 2001, some people thought that it was plausible that in order to disrupt terrorism, we could stop the money from flowing from mosques in Brooklyn to Al-Qaeda. Well, it turns out money wasn't flowing from the mosques in Brooklyn to Al-Qaeda. Terrorism financing is done abroad. We know that even more clearly from WikiLeaks now. It doesn't come from the United States, really never did. The idea was at least terribly overgrown. But there's a report that the ACLU did called Blocking Faith, Freezing Charity, which documents the horrible impact on the exercise of religion by Muslims. Muslims all over the country are terrified. They're, the FBI is in their mosques. The FBI is on their doorsteps asking about their charitable contributions. And the last story I think I'll tell you is about a charity, because this is, again, the kind of thing that happens. Um, after the government had gone after and shut down the major Muslim charities in this country, without a lot of reason to think really that they were you know, supplying money to terrorists. There were some instances where our government designated a charity and said, oh, this is really bad, they're financing terrorists. So then our government would tell other governments around the world, be careful of these people, you shut them down. So then officials in the UK or Canada or whatever would look at our evidence to see whether they agreed. And there was one case where a guy in the Canadian Ministry of Justice said, I looked at the evidence and there was no evidence. So you know, that was actually where we got more information about what our government was doing than we got directly from these other countries that said, wait a minute, based on what? Okay, so the major Muslim charities are now out of business. There are some people who started a charity called Kind Hearts for Charitable Humanitarian Development in Toledo, Ohio. And their idea was that now that the major Muslim chari charities have been put out of business, there are places in the world that are in serious need of humanitarian aid. They were focusing on Lebanon, you know, people who were refugees from war, et cetera. So they decide they're going to run a charity that is so above board that nobody in the Treasury Department could possibly raise an eyebrow. They're going to follow every rule. They're going to cross every T, dot every I. And you know, they're just going to do it all right. So there they are, they're giving toys to children and you know, providing clean water and food and whatever they're doing. And one day, all of a sudden, they get a notice that um, all of their assets are being seized because some investigator has decided to investigate them. Has anybody told them what they did wrong? Has the Treasury Department ever said to them, you know, we're concerned about that cease and desist? And they were really trying. They had one guy who worked with them who um, was rumored to work for Hamas, so they fired him. You know, they were really trying. Nobody ever said to them, don't do this, be careful, oh, you're getting too close to that. Or They didn't have a clue what the government thought they were doing wrong. So the government has now seized their assets. Well, how do you be a charity when you don't have any money? Because <laughs> the government has seized all your assets, can't do it. So the money sits in government coffers for a year, for two years, for two and a half years. There's no limit in this Patriot Act provision. Even though this charity was not on a blacklist, nobody had even made that decision. The Patriot Act permitted the government to just seize all of their assets with no hearing and with no deadline. 
So the money is just sitting with the government. And the Treasury Department has the discretion to decide to allow money that they seize to be used by some charity that they have no problem with or given back to the donors or whatever, but they've never actually granted that permission. So the money is just frozen there. So the people at Kind Hearts come to the ACLU. Actually, they don't come to the ACLU right away. They have their own lawyer. So they want their own lawyer to represent them, except their lawyer does a little research, and he discovers that he is not permitted to represent them. Because once they've become radioactive, nobody is permitted to represent them or anything else without permission from the Treasury Department. So their lawyer applies for a, a license from the Office of Foreign Assets Control, saying, may I please represent this organization? Treasury Department considers this, and they say, all right, but you're not allowed to actually um, have any economic transactions. Uh, they, they cannot pay you out of, their, out of their assets. If they can come up with other money from someplace else that we're not troubled by, you know, maybe they can pay you. So if you want to represent them, okay, but you can't get paid. Well, that lawyer says, well, you know, thanks, but never mind. So where are you going to go? They go to the ACLU. They find a couple of other volunteer lawyers. And I'm very pleased to tell you that we won that case in a district court in Ohio. The judge said, what do you mean you're just taking their money away? Isn't that an illegal search and seizure? You haven't shown any reason. You haven't explained. You've held on to it for years. You know, could you at least explain you know, why did you take the money? OK, so that case is still pending. Um, OK, before opening this up for questions, I think I'll say one other thing. Because I think that what I've written here, it's not just a book about what's been happening since 9-11. I've been teaching constitutional law and working with the ACLU for a lot of years. And I regard this as a book about the Constitution. So I've just told you about a lot of threats to the Constitution, threats to the First Amendment, threats to the Fourth Amendment, threats to checks and balances and due process and equal protection. But there's also a lot of good news in this book about where I started, like the press using its First Amendment freedom to stand up, the graduate student who was prosecuted for providing material support to terrorists because of posting links on a website, was acquitted by a jury that understood the First Amendment because we have a right to jury trial in the Constitution that allows we, the people, to make the judgment about whether the government can punish anyone. So there are individuals who can play their role. There are all sorts of ways in which the Constitution has a lot of escape hatches to allow us to play our proper role. Um, in the history of our country, in addition to Benjamin Franklin and the libraries, the other thing that you find if you look back at our early history is that Civic organizations have always been tremendously important to help individuals to gather together and, and criticize the government where necessary. So the ACLU, I think, has played a very important role in all of this, as have some other organizations. So when I tell you, the end of the story is, I think that all three branches of the federal government are failing pretty miserably at protecting our rights here in ways I really delve into in the book. And therefore, it's up to us. That doesn't mean it's just up to you as an individual. It means you can band together with other individuals and work through the ACLU or other organizations to stand up for whatever you think is right. That means you have the freedom of press and art and everything else to stand up and say what you think. And even one part of my book that I think is very interesting is even local governments have played a role. Shortly after the Patriot Act, there were 400 uh, cities, towns, villages, and eight states in this country that passed resolutions saying, we don't like it, not here, yeah, not, not unless you force us. So there are a lot of ways in which we can fight back. Um, an interviewer who was recently interviewed me closed. I thought this was great. He closed by telling his television audience, democracy is not a spectator sport. So I'm going to finish there for this part, and then I'm going to invite your questions or comments. Oh, thank you.